It's very great honor of ours to have uh, Sadat here with us, uh, one of the most distinguished individual. Uh, certainly, we know that the Bank of, of the Bank for International Settlement uh, has an office in Hong Kong. I understand that you only have two outside of your headquarters. Uh, right. One so, is here, the other is Mexico. And, um, second is Mexico. Yeah. Right. And uh, why Hong Kong? Why Hong Kong? Yeah. Because uh, when it was open, Hong Kong was the financial center in Asia and remains to be one. Uh, so it, it was a pretty easy decision. So you in. are in charge of basically half of the world in terms of BIS? So we follow from this office uh, uh, countries from um, India to New Zealand and all the way up to Japan. Or with Japan and Russia? And, and in between. Oh, okay, of course, right. Yeah. Uh, well, I think you're just the right person to ask these questions today. Uh, we all know that uh, COVID has caused a lot of trouble to individuals, to societies, to communities, but I think that its impact on the financial market can be tremendous. Uh, you being the central banker of the central banks uh, must be worried about many things. For example, you know, it is said that in England, well, it is true that in England you have QE2, Queen Elizabeth II. <laughs> but in the rest of the world, from America to Japan to China to Europe, right. you have QE1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And now with COVID, I don't know what number we're in now. And with all that money that is awash in the system today, Problem is going to arise sooner or later. So far, things seems to be okay. And as a central banker, well, the central banker of the central of the central banks, uh, how do you see the world today? What are you preparing yourself, uh, as well as what are you telling the central banks around the world to do in order to perhaps minimize minimize problems in the future? So, what is uh, what did happen in? Uh, COVID was that in the space of uh, four weeks, there was more easing done than in the space of uh, one and a half years in the global financial crisis. The, the pace and the magnitude of increase uh, was significant. And I think uh, it's a realization that when the markets freeze, uh, the first uh, job of the central banks is to unfreeze them, to provide liquidity effectively, at scale, instantly. And that was done. That was done in advanced economies and in emerging markets. Uh, that phase is uh, hopefully uh, over, the first phase. Uh, the second phase is to see what's the after effects of what's happened. Uh, and the third phase will be uh, who remains and who doesn't remain in terms of solvency. So, solvency, oh, yo, yo. So the first phase is uh, purely liquidity. And um, the good or the bad thing is central banks lend, but they can't spend. So when they lend, they create debt. Debt levels go up has to be repaid. And that is a phase uh, that is largely in the hands of uh, governments and finance ministries and fiscal budgets and less in the hands of central banks. But that calls for, looking ahead, calls for a system where um, non-performing loans are uh, looked at in a fairly serious manner supervision is tightened, and then the uh, government decides uh, how do you move forward. Uh, to what sector of society do you have income transfer to ease uh, the shortfalls? And what are the sectors that um, uh, may not uh, come back? The example I give is uh, eight restaurants of the same cuisine on the same block. I don't think all eight will come back. It's not just for Hong Kong, but anywhere. Anyway, New York too. In New York too. Yep. So Hong Kong has an uh, added problem, of course, of now a lot less tourists coming from the mainland to Hong Kong. So perhaps uh, out of the eight, we may only have four left, whereas the other places, you, will only, you may have six left. 
So one of the reactions to this uh, crisis was containment measures, which uh, have a massive impact on the services sector, on tourism, on construction. So um, that's been, I think, uh, throughout the world, that's been one sector that's uh, taken the brunt of uh, uh, the measures. And, uh, and since containment measures will be there as uh, uh, in the near future, that's the industry that um, has been hit. It uh, typically em employs uh, uh, workers that are seasonal, usually unskilled, and uh, those that don't have access to uh, the safety nets. And, uh, and that's, in, in the way forward, I think that's something that governments will need to focus on. Same thing uh, if you look at uh, migrants uh, in uh, many countries have had their employment curtailed. Um, that's something that needs to be looked at again. And Hong Kong is a perfect example that brings in uh, both of these uh, elements. Do you see any, uh, is trouble anywhere in the world imminent? There, are there parts of the world that really financially is on the brink of collapse? And what are you doing about it? And so one, uh, one th th distinguishing part of this crisis has been the speed and the scale at which central banks have reacted, not only in advanced economies where they were used to doing it uh, in the context of the global financial crisis, they learned a lot. But what's been impressive is the manner in which emerging markets have uh, reacted, often using the same tools that were used uh, by advanced economies. I think what that depicts is that uh, many times crisis is caused by a st sudden stop starting with the liquidity problem. And if uh, uh, it's not tackled uh, fairly quickly, it morphs into a solvency problem. And we have not seen that this time. And to some extent, it's a testament to both the wisdom, but also the braveness of central banks to get in there, uh, operating in areas where they haven't operated before. Have we, any see have we seen anything like that before? What would you liken the present problem to historically? Uh, the way I uh, looked at it uh, from the numbers was adding GFC, Lehman, and the temper tantrum together. Uh, it's a once-in-a-lifetime event. Uh, I don't think we've seen it, and I hope we don't see it. Well, if COVID is, an, is the first and not the only, then it is possible that in the future there may still be a similar situation that, it ha that can happen. So what's, uh, what's interesting in this crisis is that um, different sectors, different areas where uh, the central banks had not operated previously became systemic. So for example, uh, money market funds became systemic. That's an area where uh, central banks had not uh, uh, intervened before that they they showed up money market funds. And the reason was that money market funds are the primary investors in corporate bonds and um, securities. And that sector was uh, uh, under strain. And so what you have is you have a domino effect that starts. And so in this crisis, there were uh, several areas or several lines uh, that were crossed. If, if that's the word to use, uh, buying directly uh, corporate paper. Uh, many would call that credit allocation by the central bank. Uh, buying uh, government securities on the primary market. Most people will call it uh, financing the budget directly. But I think what's important is that uh, these things need to be done 
in a manner that one can explain why that action is taking place. In this case, it was to unfreeze the corporate and the treasury bill market. It has to be done in a governance framework where they are in charge. It has to be done through means that can be reversed and uh, has to be finite so that uh, it's seen to be helping a temporary problem. Any countries are doing particularly well in this regard, making less mistakes. Uh, so I, uh, I think one one impressive thing, uh, at least that I've seen, is from uh, United States to Japan, <clears throat> actions have been across the board and have been uh, pretty strong. And, and I don't want to talk about uh, where I work, but um, I think one of the hallmarks of the central banking community is that they meet frequently uh, every other month. They seriously discuss issues. On Zoom, I assume. Uh, they're doing it, yeah, on, on uh, it's Indian, good that yeah. uh, it's going on uh, uh, in the crisis also but also in peacetime, mm. because you have to prepare for this in peacetime. Because otherwise, it's not possible to do this in the space of uh, a week or 10 days if you're not prepared. But uh, throughout, uh, they've, um, they meet, they're serious about the interaction, they talk about the difficulties, the constraints, what has worked, what hasn't. And, and this involves uh, central banks from advanced economies and uh, emerging markets. So there's a lot of knowledge sharing that takes place. And it, it, it's a strong input into creating r resilience through the world. How, how long do you think it would take to unwind this, unwind this whole thing? buying corporate papers in the money market. Uh, everything seems to be warped today in the financial market. Extraordinary time f needs extraordinary measures, I assume. Right. So how, how long will it take to unwind this thing? So there's quite... Even uh, if COVID is over. Yeah, so if COVID is over, there's quite a bit to be unwound. Uh, and not just in the, in the financial sector, but <clears throat> there's... So straight in the financial sector, what needs to be unwound is uh, uh, the, that when the appropriate time comes to withdraw liquidity, uh, the, uh, the government finance ministries have to take over the process of uh, how they deal with the social consequences of that withdrawal. So that's one. Second, uh, um, in terms of potential growth, uh, looking ahead, um, uh, the challenges will remain. I think they'll remain for a long period of time. Uh, global value chains have been destroyed. Uh, the, uh, they will need to be reorganized in some manner, which will uh, pull the future growth down. Um, one uh, big uh, hit has been taken by the loss of human capital. So uh, the way I see it uh, for human capital is all work done by Jim Heckman at Chicago shows that the years zero to seven or eight are most prominent in, uh, in building up human capital. So if one out of six years is lost, or one out of seven years is lost, uh, that's already a 15% human wow. capital. That will persist for 60 years. Wow. Never thought and, that and that's something that needs to be factored in, that how do we build up the capital that has been lost? Uh, there will be uh, other consequences in terms of whether there's widening of inequality. There'll be social issues that will come out of it. So that's on the negative side. Uh, one, the positive impact is technology. That the world has got digitalized. Uh, 
in the space of a few months that would have taken years. Uh, so that's positive. The negative part of that is that unskilled labor is likely to be hit because many of the jobs that they were doing have probably got digitalized. So this is a long-term affair. Second, uh, the consequence of this crisis will be higher debt levels uh, across the board, for higher public debt, which weighs down on growth. I would imagine corporate debt as and well. And corporate right. debt too. So that, I think that will be the challenges on how society embraces it. Uh, it's a global challenge and international cooperation is uh, essential to work through this. And, um, but that, that's going to be the challenge ahead. If debt is going to go up, well, not if, since debt, debt has, gone, debt has up. gone up, right. Yeah. So how do, we, how do you maintain lower in, low interest rate to make sure that it doesn't rise? Because if it goes up, oh my, the whole world is in trouble. So right now, government the, and corporates. Yeah. So right now, the, the uh, what what was helpful was uh, that all jurisdictions are struggling to meet their inf inflation targets. So uh, central banks could keep easing uh, on public debt at low rates uh, could be placed. Uh, the question would be as exit takes place and rates begin to rise. Uh, how do you handle the justification of rising rates and a large uh, debt stock? Uh, but that, that, that will need to be faced in the future. And we've seen this happen uh, a few times before. Usually high growth has worked the world out of a debt scenario uh, over a period of time. To some extent, uh, inflation in the range of uh, uh, the low single digits has also worked the way out of it. But we're not going to see fast growth or quick growth you know, for, for some time to come. So we'll probably see uh, Asia returning to trend uh, down the coast. Uh, it'll be more challenging in Europe and the Americas. I think the prediction... Why? Because uh, they've been, uh, global output has been moving towards Asia, potential is higher. Uh, the two countries that were leading it were India and China, which of course, because of the crisis, will see lower growth. But all figures that the IMF has put out is a return, returning back to trend. I think what we are unable to figure out is which letter of the alphabet it's going to look like, whether it's a V or a W or a U or a L. L. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, that's, and that's the worry. But also the worry is that uh, uh, whether we've seen the end of the uh, crisis, they go through phase one, the countries seem to enter phase two, and some are back to phase three now. Well, you mentioned about supply chain. Uh, very unfortunately, uh, the COVID-19 hit right at a time when US-China relationship is in a terrible shape. And so the United States and indeed the West are already uh, trying to change uh, the, the, the supply chain picture in the world. And rightly so, you, if you're buying 95% uh, of the world's mass from one country right. is a little bit problematic. So, so COVID has helped wake up people. How do you see it changing and how long will it take? So what's uh, unclear is uh, as to what direction it will take. So, for example, uh, after the global financial crisis, the focus was on res resilience of banks. So the entire focus was whether they had the buffers, they had the capital. Uh, I think the focus after this crisis is uh, likely to be on the resilience of companies. Resilience of companies. companies. Um, how, um, on how uh, well prepared they are in terms of uh, uh, their um, uh, 
capital base, how um, uh, strong they are in terms of managing supply chains. Uh, um, and that's a process that has several aspects. Um, uh, one of them you mentioned in terms of uh, being resilient uh, in the face of something like this to be able to survive. So I think we had uh, moved to what some economists call is a just-in-time model, where goods arrived in time, production was in time. Uh, we likely to move to some kind of a just-in-case model. Just in case. It's model where you have to provide for some insurance a larger amount than before mm -hmm. uh, in case uh, the parts don't arrive. Mm. And, and that's, uh, that weighs on growth. That right. weighs Correct. on uh, the production cost. That weighs on the output. I understand that you also have some slides you want to sh show us. Uh, uh, yeah, I was going to... Um, uh, walk you through Please history, do. but uh, what is uh, amazing is that a place like uh, Asia Society, history is usually seen in decades, centuries, millenniums. I'm going to do it in the last four months. Good. So we love it. <laughs> well, we need it. I don't yeah. know if we love it. We need it. <laughs> So this is something we put together um, uh, rather quickly as the uh, virus took hold. And uh, I think it's fair to say in the last six months, we've witnessed the economic carnage of historical proportions, which uh, re got responses of a similar kind. And so, uh, for the next few minutes, it's an economic travelogue uh, through the period. So let's look at the COVID-19 timeline. Uh, by now, it's quite familiar to you. Uh, you've lived through it. The epidemiologists always recommend measures that brings R0 or R0, that they call it, below one. So R0 is the basic reproductive number. If it is above one, the virus spreads. If it's below one, the virus recedes. And that's the blue, the blue line on, uh, on the chart. If you look at it, containment measures went up as much as 80% of the world, and they're hovering around 50% of the world right now. The immediate impact of this lockdown was extremely severe. Um, so here is uh, the impact that uh, happened right away. And you can see that in a matter of weeks, uh, everything tanked uh, in sight. Uh, this wasn't a normal recession. It was bringing the, putting the, the patient into an induced coma and uh, induced by policy actions to prevent a large-scale public health disaster on one hand and avert unnecessary bankruptcies on the other. Impact is both sharp, the way you the speed at which uh, the decline took place, and the impact was violent. On the demand side, lockdowns and social distancing to tr trigger the sudden stop in expenditures. But more importantly for policymakers, they made, they made spending insensitive to policy actions. So you could reduce rates, but maybe there was no place to spend. Mm. And that added to the complexity of the policy making, and I'll come to it in a second. So in the Lord's government, if they give money, then they still know where to spend. Know where to spend, exactly. And so the usual channels that we used to deploy before uh, were weaker in this. 
on the supply side, what we talked about, uh, local, local and global value chains uh, were disrupted. And the combination of both of these led to a massive uh, decrease in output. Equities tanked, that's the red line in front. Bond yields uh, dropped, spreads spiked. And the response of the central banks was equally massive, and I'll come to it a little bit later. So the damage was quick and severe, and the damage was widespread. Uh, on quick and severity, global GDP contracted by more than 10% in Q1, even though the containment measures were only enacted in March in many of the jurisdictions. Wow. So quarter one was taken down by what happened in, uh, uh, it happened in the third month. Damage was widespread in advanced economies, emerging markets, low-income countries. So if you add the severity with how widespread it was, in the space of five months, IMF forecasts for global growth went from plus three and a half percent to minus five. In living memory, I have not seen eight and a half percent of global swing. growth swing in the space of four months. And that's how severe this has been. So what do you think the numbers may be for the second, second quarter of this year? I don't know. Don't I know. won't even guess. Don't guess. <laughs> I won't even. I see some countries with more than 10%, 10%, 50% yeah. drop. Yeah, so some recent data is coming out. It's quite large. I don't know where global growth is going to be. Mm. Uh, impact on jobs uh, was uh, severe. Uh, as you can see, the surge in uh, jobless claims in the United States was huge. In March to May alone, in the space of two months, uh, it was uh, in the tens of millions. In Europe, uh, unemployment would have been higher had there hadn't been special government programs to subsidize employment. In emerging market, the true unemployment is a little bit hidden because of the, uh, the widespread nature of the informal economy that it's not measured uh, the way it would be measured uh, elsewhere. International spillovers uh, from various supply and demand disruptions worsened the blow. Global trade volumes collapsed as supply chains were shut down. Restrictions on international cargo were another source of disruption. Fear of contagion and travel ban depressed tourism that we talked about. Global air transport plummeted. Commodity prices, especially oil, plummeted. And for low-income countries and middle-income countries, uh, they are likely to be hit hard by a drop in remittances. And remittances today are more than foreign direct investment and ODA put together. Mm. So that drop, when it happens, will be another blow uh, uh, to the economies. Uh, financial markets were profoundly shaken and the challenge was, how does one intervene so that they don't derail the economy further uh, as there were heavy sell-offs across a wide range of assets. Equity markets, uh, prices tanked, spread spiked, funding markets uh, seized up, and this is on the left-hand side. Market strain led to a dash for cash. Money market funds accelerated redemptions. And as I was mentioning earlier, uh, these funds invest in short-term bank and corporate paper. And there was a withdrawal of about 15% of assets under management. 15%? 15% during that time. Oh. $160 billion uh, 
in the space of a few weeks. Mm. The dash for cash forced leveraged investors to liquidate their positions from historically low levels in mid-March. This is the dip in the red and the blue lines. Historically low levels, both long-term U.S. Treasury and bond yields soared uh, as the crisis uh, engulfed the markets. Corporate funding markets froze. And emerging markets faced a perfect storm with threats to globalization, disruption of global value chains. Emerging markets faced a triple stop. So first, the decline in activity from containment measures. Uh, second, uh, as we saw in the first chart, uh, that commodity prices collapsed, including a decline in remittances that led to a sharp depreciation of emerging market currencies and a reversal of capital flows uh, larger than what we saw in the previous episode. So the red line looks at COVID-19. The blue line is the taper tantrum and the yellow line is the Lehman bankruptcy. And you can see how fast it went in a short period of time. In March alone, investors withdrew over $80 billion from emerging markets, the largest single month capital outflow that we've seen in a long time. Wow. In some countries, foreign direct investment turned into outflows, uh, Brazil and Poland, and there was a reversal of carry trades. Spreads on local currency bonds spiked alongside those in foreign currency bonds. And investors began to withdraw. A wave of downgrades followed. By end May, the number of downgrades and reductions in ratings by one major rating agency climbed to over uh, 1,800, including 200 in the energy sector. And this represents over one third of the rated non-financial corporate debt universe. So a large part of the universe uh, uh, was affected. Mutual funds investing in corporate debt experienced a sharp, sharp outflow, forcing them to sell. And I had mentioned before in one week, 15% uh, of net asset value was uh, withdrawn. The repricing of uh, risk by foreign investors in local currency bond markets led to a sharp tightening in domestic financial conditions. So that was the second tightening uh, internally uh, in uh, emerging markets. So once the pandemic became uh, a clear, became a distinct possibility, central banks undertook massive, unprecedented policy actions to prevent a financial collapse. Uh, the first action was to cut rates uh, right away, taking them down to the zero lower bound. They introduced open-ended open asset purchase programs to unclock the market and to unclock the market maker's balance sheets and restart issuance and injected liquidity through open market operations. Emerging markets has had less room to maneuver. So the rate cuts were continuous, keeping with how they were uh, enacting in the past, but at a slower pace. As dislocations in domestic funding markets appeared, there was injection directly into these markets. 
Central banks also intervened in the commercial paper, in government securities, and in United States for the first time in the municipal market. So they went down to uh, local levels. They also expanded their playbook and some of the non-traditional measures included lifelines to businesses in distress <clears throat> by either purchasing debt outright bonds or commercial paper or providing backstops for bank lending in the form of lending especially to small and medium-sized enterprises central banks also went down the credit scales sometime below investment grade and to local authorities even though resources were available banks did not have the incentive to lend so some governments provided full loan guarantees like Hong Kong. Here's a chart where vast amount of liquidity was injected in the space of two months, which is substantially more and substantially exceeded what was done in the global financial crisis between 2008 and 2010. So in a few weeks, the injection was both widespread and severe compared to what happened a decade, more than a decade earlier over the period of 18 months. A significant use of reserve currencies that dollars uh, pound sterling, um, uh, the euro, and others. It takes place offshore. And very, what is very typical is that the time of market stress, the demand for reserve currencies increases, and it's always a demand for US dollars. And the supply decreases because it uh, affects the bank's risk-taking capacity. So there's a shortage of dollars. The Fed activated standing swap lines with the first five of these banks. So it's ECB, Japan, England, Swiss National Bank, and Canada. In addition, the Fed established nine temporary additional swap lines with central banks from six to 14. In addition to that, in the month of March, the Fed put in place a temporary repo facility that allowed central banks, including those without established swap lines, to obtain liquidity by pledging US uh, Treasury securities. The combination of uh, what I showed you before in terms of uh, yeah, the combination of this severity of injection on the right side with the global provision of swap facilities and repo facilities come the markets. So in, in summarizing all of this, uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, Central banks cut policy rates, introduced open-ended asset purchase programs to unclog the market maker's balance sheet. So in some ways, till now, central banks were lenders of last resort. They became the market makers of last resort uh, in this crisis. And that's a place that they have not been before. They injected liquidity via open market operations, extended US dollar swap lines that we saw, but also took measures on the prudential and the regulation front. They released the accumulated buffers uh, that had been accumulated uh, over the last decade. 
adopted more flexible interpretation of uh, requirements and loan classifications and uh, place various restrictions on distributions, including dividends that has been a source of discussion in many jurisdictions. One uh, defining uh, moment of uh, this uh, crisis is that uh, uh, central bank actions were not uh, alone. Uh, as I uh, was mentioning before, crucial that they are, uh, they have one major limitation, and that is that they provide temporary financing. They cannot provide a real transfer of resources. And uh, governments around the world uh, announce large scale fiscal packages. Uh, in advanced economies, uh, outright transfer through income support, expanded unemployment insurance, wage subsidies, tax rebates, and waivers amounted approximately to about 10% of GDP. Um, contingent financing was larger, so this is equity injections, loan guarantees, amounted to about 30% of GDP. Emerging markets face much tighter constraints with uh, outright transfers on the left side uh, amounting to about 3% of GDP as opposed to 10 in advanced economies. Fiscal packages uh, reflecting all these measures uh, took several forms. Uh, some countries uh, adopted a blanket approach where they granted tax waivers or cash grants to all residents. Some countries adopted a targeted approach where they targeted those most affected uh, by the shutdown. For example, extending the duration and coverage of unemployment benefits. But this left significant parts of the population in dire straits, for example, young people entering the job market, self-employed workers. Uh, in many uh, emerging markets, uh, governments uh, expanded social assistance programs. Some countries provided uh, subsidies to industries that they considered were vital for their economy. Looking ahead, and this is what uh, you had raised uh, right in the beginning, the legacy of these me measures will lead to a much higher public indebtedness. Uh, early the forecasts from the IMF uh, look at a primary deficit increase of about uh, eight percentage points of GDP. Public debt will increase uh, substantially. Um, uh, in uh, definitely advanced economies, but also emerging markets. But emerging markets have less room to maneuver. So in uh, conclusion, <clears throat> this by all uh, designs uh, is once in a lifetime event. The most vulnerable sectors of the economy, uh, SMEs and unskilled workers, have suffered the most. Central banks took massive action, both in terms of monetary stimulus, purchases of corporate debt, outright purchases of debt, support for SMEs uh, through funding for lending schemes, global level through expanded swap lines, repo facilities, a massive uh, fiscal uh, packages in uh, various countries. And there will be legacies of this crisis as we talked about. Uh, a much higher level of debt, both public and private, which will weigh on potential growth. The destruction of supply chains that will lower growth. Uh, my worry is a 
a significant loss in human capital that will stay with us for many decades. On the positive side, whether digitalization will be a Schumpeterian shock, whether there would be creative destruction that um, takes us forward. So I'm going to stop here. That's superb, Sadat. It is really very comprehensive, and thank you very much. I just want to open to uh, any questions. If anyone want to uh, ask a question, just raise your hand. Uh, I apologize that originally this is supposed to be a lunch program, but because of the second wave of COVID, uh, the Hong Kong government came up with some policies tightening again, and so we had to cancel our lunch, and hence we're doing it in this format. But anyway, if anybody wants to... Okay, I got some questions here. Um, let's see, Michael Young... Oh, Michael, I know Michael. Uh, <laughs> can you unmute him from the standard charger, I believe? Yes, Michael. Uh, Ronnie. Hi, yes. Ronnie. Yes. How are you? Good. You want to ask a question or you want me to read it for you? Um, I, I can ask since I have Please. the mic. I w wanted to ask, um, you know, how do you explain the schizophrenia between financial markets and the real economy? And longer term, my concern is that, I mean, we're, we're seeing a lot of investors also making very good returns. Uh, but at the same time, a lot of people are losing jobs. So the social impact and that consequence of that wealth um, divide um, looks like it's just going to get worse from an already challenging uh, point. So that's a very good question. Um, uh, the, the challenge always is that when markets have frozen, they need to be unclogged. And when that is happening, central banks do not uh, make distinction between uh, uh, what, between the nature of the recipient, whether this is going to um, entities or uh, people who have uh, exposure to the financial markets or not. And so uh, the first part was partly intentional that uh, there was a sudden drop in equity prices. It was seizing up financial markets. Um, the, that reversal was intended. You have, a, you have a very good question whether uh, uh, this kind of intervention over time uh, uh, leads to uh, wealth inequality or income inequality. So all the studies that have uh, been, uh, that I've looked at is that uh, this kind of uh, in intervention is net positive during a contractionary time. But the side effects of a crisis like this often can lead to uh, an increase in inequality, often leads to a larger unemployment for unskilled workers. And that's the area where fiscal policy and governments need to focus on. Uh, the, in, in this crisis, uh, as opposed to the global financial crisis where the focus was on shoring up banks. In this crisis, the focus was on shoring up employment. And that has been, uh, that's very different to what happened in the past. Uh, fiscal policy will need to focus on job retraining and transferring real resources, maintaining social cohesion. Okay, next question is Robert McCarthy, uh, and then followed by, uh, following on that is uh, Vivek. So, uh, Robert, please, are you there? Please. Unmuted, huh? All uh, right. You're on. By uh, Bank Indonesia, um, where they've agreed to buy government bond issues directly from the government, uh, essentially to fund the, the budget deficit. Now, you know, you can say quantitative easing in general may assist in, in funding budget deficits, but this is, I think, maybe the only central bank uh, 
that I know of where, where there was an explicit agreement between the government and the bank uh, as to how much they would buy and, and, and what proportion of the deficit they would fund. Um, I mean, how, how do you view this at BIS and, um, and, and, or do you think that this is something that's going to start happening in other countries as well? So one of the things that I'd mentioned uh, was that in, in this crisis, uh, a few red lines were, or, or what were previously red lines were crossed, right? And one was directly buying uh, corporate debt uh, straight off, which uh, uh, many people will see as uh, allocation of credit uh, by a central bank. And the second was uh, buying government paper on the primary market rather than the secondary market. This was uh, a, a red line that had been crossed. I think extraordinary times uh, need extraordinary measures. When you are on a war, uh, you don't uh, finance a war by market funding. You uh, get in there and you finance what needs to be financed. The key will be uh, how the withdrawal takes place, what is the communication in, in the, uh, for central banks, how they, how they make sure that the nexus uh, between monetary and fiscal policy is not pushed uh, to a boundary that undermines uh, their credibility and their effectiveness. But that's an area where, where more, I, th I think that's the next phase of this crisis, that uh, markets had to be unclogged, and that was the job of the central banks. But once you unclog them, the, the, the temp temporary measures in due course will be unwound. I think th what the measure will be, the. Uh, how they approach uh, their duty to, or their mandate, legally enshrined mandate to manage inflationary expectations. Right now, uh, in every jurisdiction, inflation is uh, well below the target. And as they begin to approach those limits, they will have to tighten and they will have to articulate why they're doing that. Okay, Vivek, are you on? Vivek, Patan? Yeah, there you are. Please. Are you on? Uh, yeah, you're on. Nope, it's, we lost need him. To, <clears throat> need to unmute him. Unmute him. Okay. Okay, okay now. Uh, what, in your view, is the risk to sovereigns, uh, and which ones do you think are most vulnerable? And in terms of timing, how do you think it will play out? Uh, so, uh, look, uh, all the all the sovereigns have um, uh, will end up with a higher debt level, uh, uh, higher public indebtedness. Some will probably uh, have lower growth in the uh, in the uh, medium to long term. And amongst the economists, there's quite a bit of uh, discussion whether uh, what should we preemptively uh, look at this, should there be a standstill? Some economists talk about debt cancellation. And, uh, and the way, I think the way to unpack this a little bit is that for low income countries, there is a framework in place, which is the Paris Club framework that looks at this. There are procedures uh, that uh, come into play to provide relief. For emerging markets that are borrowing large amounts of money from the IMF, there is a framework to look at how this is handled uh, in the case, in those cases where debt sustainability uh, cannot be assured with uh, high probability. So we're looking at the rest who don't fall into these two categories. Uh, two things are uh, common between them. Their payments capacity differs. Uh, 
amongst the rest of the markets and the impact of the shock differs amongst uh, those countries. And so I think it'll have to be handled on a case by case basis uh, as these countries uh, get into payment difficulties. Okay, El Reyes followed by David Tang. El from Hong Kong, you? Yes, hi, thanks very much for uh, presentation. Um, it, over the global financial crisis, there was this narrative that uh, central banks were sort of holding the can uh, with the QE and that uh, governments were then resisting doing the kind of real restructuring reforms that they needed to, to do to improve resilience. So I'm wondering what your assessment is of the reform restructuring measures that were taken or maybe not taken during the GFC and how well or maybe not that they have prepared economies and financial systems for the current crisis we're in. Thanks. So one uh, major improvement uh, post GFC was strengthening the banking sector in terms of uh, the liquidity solvency buffers that were put in place. Uh, one thing I should have mentioned was that uh, one characteristic of this crisis was that broadly speaking, the financial sector withstood the crisis when the gyrations were of historic proportions. And compared to the global financial crisis, they entered this crisis far stronger than before. Um, look at emerging markets, or look at Asia for that matter. Uh, Asia entered COVID-19 far more resilient than it was in the global financial crisis or in the Asian crisis. Much larger buffers, including larger reserves, that allowed us uh, allowed it to uh, hand to deal with it straight on. So the challenge now will be that the reforms are in areas that are squarely uh, uh, within the control of the sovereign. Retraining, education, uh, transitioning from analog to digital which will have profound effects through the economy, but they will need to be tackled. So in some ways, the GFC provided or got us to build up the buffers that were used in this crisis, but the challenge ahead is very different. Okay, last question from David Tang. David, are you on? Yes, thank you, Ronnie. Uh, so I'd like to bring the discussion from the macro to the micro in terms of Hong Kong. There's been recent discussions uh, regarding U.S. Uh, weaponizing the U.S. dollar and restricting the trading of U.S. dollars in Hong Kong. How much of a risk is that? Uh, so um, that's a question above my league. Uh, that's a question for Ronnie. Well, anyway, David, uh, offline, why don't you give me a call and we'll talk about <laughs> that one. But anyway, uh, I think that throughout this uh, crisis, uh, some, there are some un unsung heroes. In the medical field, there's tons of them, uh, and they are really admirable, but I suppose there's another kind that is the central bankers. Yeah. Whether you like them or not, usually a lot of people don't appreciate them, but when you have a time such as today, holy, they became actually behind the scenes some of the most important people. Uh, and they si save life probably more than any um, individual medical doctors could do. So I want to thank you, uh, Sadat, for uh, being such a wonderful uh, guest speaker today, but also for all the work that you're doing at BIS. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, many, many central banks uh, appreciate uh, your presence in Asia. I think I hope you will stay here for a long, 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 long time to come. Uh, and Bonnie, great to have you. Uh, that's uh, the wife. Uh, she's lovely. But anyway, you, you can see her. Uh, we're wonderful to have this program. I apologize again for having to uh, change the, uh, the lunch format into a Zoom format, but I think it works well. Uh, Don, can I, next time? Uh, uh, anyway, uh, okay. Uh, I think we better call it quit here because of the time we want to uh, end on time. So ladies and gentlemen, how about a round of uh, a virtual clap to uh, our great speaker today? Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you, Ronnie, Alice, and Anne. Uh, thank you for hosting. Thank you.